I think ahead, as my mother taught me, she used to buy Chanel. That's it, Chanel jackets. I've always told this story. 40 years later, when she passes away, the women in my family fought like cats and dogs to get at her clothing. Her vintage Chanel jackets were trading for thousands of dollars in the open market. I had to beat them with a stick saying, hold on, <laughs> we, got, we got to allocate this stuff amongst you. You know, this is mom's stuff, but she was, she was crazy about that. She would only buy when she was a young girl, one Chanel jacket in a year. And she wore it her whole life. That kind of thinking about quality purchase, about style and fashion, which is something you know about. Um, you know, like I spent months and months uh, on these cufflinks with Deacon in London, you know, deciding to buy these. And they were one of a kind made for me because I know 20 years from now, these cufflinks, they're not going down in value. You were talking about your mother buying Chanel jackets. You were in a different um, income bracket it sounds like than than a lot of people were you you if she was buying Chanel jackets, you know. She well, that, had that's some the funny thing. No, she wasn't. She was a seamstress on a you know on a factory floor making kids' winter clothing. Gentlemen, welcome back to the Alpha M podcast. And today I am so incredibly excited to be joined by one of my old amigos and, and somebody that I got to know off of Shark Tank uh, briefly. Um, you know, he really doesn't need much of an introduction. If you've watched the show Shark Tank, you've, you know, basically been on the internet. You have run into this guy. His name is Kevin O'Leary. He is a entrepreneur. He is incredibly successful. And hopefully today he's going to impart some amazing wisdom. Also talk a little bit about um, my hope today is to talk a little bit about investing, talk a little bit about business entrepreneurship, and really just to give people a little more information about, you know, really just just finances. Because honestly, Kevin, um, I don't know if this is something you dealt with, but for me, you know, education about money is something that we're not taught about in school, right? It's something that that you know we're taught about, you know, about sewing, about soccer, about health, about sex, but we aren't actually taught about money and money is one of those things that unless you're surrounded by people that get it, you've got to learn on your own. And that learning experience can be very humbling. It can also be incredibly expensive. It's a, at least it was for me. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Kevin, that wasn't really a question, but thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Great to be here. But you know, I, I must say you're on a good theme there because we really have lacked in financial literacy, particularly in high school. Florida's changed that. They've now instituted, uh, you know, learning about credit card debt and understanding investing. But where it really ma manifested itself and freaked me out that last March when the COVID the whole thing started, and I started, uh, you know, working with my companies and I'm an investor in getting those PPP loans, I was stunned to find out, and we're talking about tens of thousands of people here, between my own company's employees, I've got over 50 of them now in almost every state, plus our supply chain, we have over 10,000 people in their sort of late 20s, early 30s. Virtually all of them had nothing invested or saved. They were running on two weeks of salary, virtually nothing in the bank. I mean, it, and the reason we found out is we were, you know, you have to show your payroll records to the government Feb 15th, and they were going to look at them again June 30 and determine, you know, had you increased or maintained payroll to get the PPP, get the favorable terms for those loans. And so I started, you know, just doing some polling and saying, well, look, uh, if we have to cut your salary in half, if we have to furlough you, or if we even have to let you go, where do you stand? And that's when I found out that nobody has anything saved. It's, it's a huge problem. It is a huge problem. First thing I want to talk about, though, Kevin, what watch are you wearing? <laughs> what watch are you wearing right now? Oh, well, okay. Right now, that's a great question, Aaron. Yeah, As a matter of fact, this is a... Um, a vintage, the last time they made this was 2015. This is the steel white face Daytona with the steel bezel. And the reason I have this watch is I'm, this is a hold in my portfolio of Rolex Daytonas. And the reason I wouldn't buy it from anybody is most of these watches in the aftermarket have been polished. Now, when you polish a steel watch, you destroy its value. It has no investable value. But I came along, um, I can't say who he is because I promised I wouldn't disclose it. He had bought this in 2015 and only wore it five times. Had the box. I sent over an accredited watchmaker to inspect it. 
And uh, sure and behold, it had never been polished. It was virtually brand new. Now, this watch probably has appreciated over 100% since 2015. They trade for about 29,000. I traded one of my new Daytonas for it with him, which many people say you're crazy, but I'm not because getting a vintage one like this is even more valuable, you wanna, or at least in this case, equivalent value to a new one. You wanna hear a horrible story? That was the third watch I ever bought and um, that, that exact model. And I wasn't wearing it. And, and the reason I bought it was because I was watching Shark Tank and I looked at Robert's wrist and I'm like, Robert's wearing something that looks, it's got like, it's got like a, a, a leather strap on it or something. I couldn't tell what it was. I, I zoomed in and I'm like, I think that's a, a Rolex Daytona. It's beautiful. And okay, I guess he must've put a strap on it. Anyway, long story short, I ended up buying the watch. This was back when you could actually, if you knew an authorized dealer, you could get a deal on, on a watch. And I bought yeah. that, that watch. I wasn't wearing it though, because it didn't have a date. And so I ended up uh, wanting to basically get the, uh, the, the Yacht Master rose gold on the black flex strap, oyster flex strap. And so I ended up selling that watch to somebody for eight grand. Okay, well, <laughs> let me just make a comment about that. You, Aaron, are an idiot. That was I a am huge an idiot. Well, mistake. Well, well that, that, is, that, is, that is true. But here, while we're on the topic of watches, it's something that you're absolutely passionate about. And it's something that I love as well. Um, I was fortunate to actually see some of your collection. You, you travel with multiple watches uh, when, when you travel. And so when I actually had the opportunity to come and hang out with you for the afternoon, you showed me not only your watches, but your pen collection. You are an yes. avid pen collector. And something that I learned from you is that the only pens that are really collectible are Mont Blanc. Everything else is kind of, and I probably butchered the way you pronounce it. Everything else is kind of like, eh, not that important or uh, not that investable. But you are also a huge watch investor or a uh, uh, pen investor as well. Yes. Well, I do collect pens. Uh, Mont Blanc has emerged over the last 15 years as the leader. They make, uh, for example, there's a new pen they just announced a few weeks ago called the Elvis. They are making 98 Elvis pens and it's going to have etched in it. Elvis has left the building. It's going to have all kinds of studded diamonds and rubies. And you're getting on it. one. You're on the list. Well, you cannot disclose that because uh, you have to petition, uh, and and if should should you get when you really can't talk about it until it's in your hands. So I, I don't want to mess with the primal forces, but I collect okay. very very high end pants. Why? Because they're great investments. And so uh, Mont Blanc just launched another series uh, with Egyptian hieroglyphics on it. As a matter of fact, if you don't mind me stepping out of the frame, I have it sitting right here. I thought I'd show it to you. Kevin, this is your show, baby. Yeah. So <laughs> this is, um, since 1929, I think that my Mont Blanc may have invented the push button, pen, you know, ordinary ballpoint pen. They brought it back for the first time in this hieroglyphic series. We've got hieroglyphics, Egyptian hieroglyphics on it, um, the tomb of death and life, you know, sort of the whole story of life and death, plus in Egyptian hieroglyphics, Mont Blanc written. And very they tried nice. to figure, but, th but that's a beautiful pen. And the way, reason I like it, very functional, so I could have that on me. Now, speaking of new watches, I have not put red bands on any of these because they're new, but. Um, the new uh, Kermit, which I think the new 41 millimeter, I'll just give mm -hmm. you a quick look at these are in my traveling pouch. You're right, I basically travel with these. The 41 millimeter r made of white gold, uh, Submariner with the blue bezel, mm -hmm. this thing's gone through the roof in Asia. And the Kermit, which is an entry level priced watch has doubled in value in four weeks. So there is an opportunity to invest wisely, Aaron, in watches and get a return from it, which is a theme yeah. I think, you, you know, you, you, you talked of. Uh, if you're going to buy a watch and you're not going to just buy an electronic watch, you really should think through the long-term value of your money that you're putting away in, into that. And that's for everything in life. It, it applies to cars, applies to clothing, applies to anything. Don't Two buy questions. garbage. Two questions, and you touched on them briefly. Okay, so question number one, um, if you have $1,000, what watch do you buy? Well, a thousand dollars is tough, um, but the best value for your dollar in watches anywhere in the world is Grand Seiko. I knew Grand you were going to say that. Yeah, Grand Seiko has proven itself and just recently uh, released a series of new calibers, which will be coming on the market probably at the end of this month or December, just before the holiday. That 
um, rivals anybody's technology in terms of accuracy. It's, you know, I, I, I hate to say this, but it's as good, and I won't mention the other names, but I have had a preview of the technology and seen the movement. It is probably the best movement in the world currently. And they have, they have done something that even the great Swiss companies um, are challenged to do. Their accuracy now is, is incredible. And there's mechanical right. watches. What about $10,000? Let's jump up. All right. Oh, I think a lot of people see a lot of people are, are asp watches are an aspirational thing, yeah. right? You know, yeah. something that you said to me that, that I absolutely love when we we're talking about watches was, you know, there's, there are conversation starters. There's always typically a story that goes around, you know, with, with a watch. And so it's a great, you know, conversation piece. $10,000 is that price point where I think like now you're like, okay, do you buy a pre-owned you know, something a little bit, you know, higher end, you go yeah, I, something. Aaron, that's, I, that's I, do, I do not, I do not uh, tell people for their first piece to ever buy pre-owned because unless you really know what you're doing and you have a very credible dealer, you can get so screwed over on pre-owned vintage watches. Uh, first of all, they're generally polished. Second of all, you don't know, uh, you know, the provenance of them, what they've been through. There are certain dealers you can work with, but for, if you're gonna buy your first watch, you know, you can get an entry level Rolex for 10,000. Um, you certainly can get Grand Seiko for 10,000. Um, it, it's, it's that, you know, if you can, if you can actually spend 2000 more, you can get into, you know, a Submariner, steel Submariner, which is, it has held its value forever. When you buy one of those and 20 years later, you know, there's a story of a guy that bought for, for $485 a Daytona back in 1971 when he was in the army and he forgot- He was on Antique Roadshow. Yes, right? $700,000. And I, I use that <laughs> as an example of long, now not everybody's gonna leave it and never wear it, but sure. even Paul Newman's watch that he wore sold for 17 and a half million. These are stories of Rolex. So the big brands for appreciation, there's actually four of them now. Um, it's Rolex, it's Patek Philippe, it's Edimor Piquet, which is the Royal Oak. And now creeping in, um, is FP Journe. The FP Journe pieces, even though the company is a micro brand, only makes 900 watches a year. The, the appreciation on those pieces is stunning. Just up 100% as soon as you walk out of the store. All right, good deal. Now, are you a car guy? Uh, yeah, to a certain extent, yeah. Except you know, it's really hard to put to, to inventory cars. After you buy three of them, they become a real pain in the ass. Where do you put them? What, what do you drive? Daily driver. I'm, I'm now driving a vintage Porsche Carrera four wheel drive, 20 year old, I keep it in perfect condition. And I just bought, just for the hell of it, a Ford 150 uh, pickup truck because the thing is like a rolling living room. It's got yeah. so much stuff in it. Yeah, I couldn't help myself. I wanted something funky chicken and uh, mm -hmm. with a little room in it. So, you know, I'm gonna put an easy rider rifle rack in the back window and just gonna ride around. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about Shark Tank. Shark Tank has not only changed the lives of of millions or not millions, but but hundreds of, if not thousands of entrepreneurs, but it's also changed your life because prior to Shark Tank, you were you know a successful entrepreneur, but you didn't have the fame and notoriety that you do now. Now, with the fame and notoriety, you put your name, you put your stamp on pretty much anything and it's automatic going to be you know successful which is one of the value of values of having a shark be an investor on shark tank how has shark tank changed and evolved over what is this 12 years this is the 12th yeah. season right 12 12 how, season how is it how is how has the show evolved but then how have the entrepreneurs and the pitches evolved what i have seen is that they've gotten you know in the early days it could just be a concept or an idea and, and they would be allowed on the show. Now, these businesses are legit businesses that a lot of people yeah. have already heard of. And, and they're already doing millions in revenue and, and, you know, and, and, and ultimately successful. How have you seen it evolve over the 12 years? In the first two years, three years, and this is the same, this format is on not just in US, it's on Canada, New Zealand, England, uh, Brazil. The, the show had no traction because, you know, people thought, well, this is, I, I work all day at the office. Do I really want to go home and watch more shows on business? And everybody thought it was going to fail, but that's not what happened. Um, in its fourth year, it, it skyrocketed geometrically. It went from three or 400,000 people watching it to 5 million 
in a matter of months and then 10 million through syndication. And today it enjoys a, a massive audience because the tape is on in 34 countries. So people watch Shark Tank in London, um, in Austria. I have, a, I have a funny story. I was on a, on a, on a train between uh, Geneva, Switzerland and Zurich. And this couple came over and said, hey, can, aren't you Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank? And I said, yeah. And she said, you're the most hated man in Austria. Can, we just got married. Can I get a picture with you? And I said, wow, I'm just honored. Like, that's fantastic. So it's really gotten very big globally. Same in Spain, et cetera. I, I think what, what's happened is when you ask yourself, and certainly all the competitors have tried to knock it off, what are you really watching when you watch Shark Tank? You're, in my view, you're watching this, the pursuit of freedom. People that are successful financially in life, Aaron, you know this, are afraid to do what they choose. Are, are they, they want to pursue their own passions. It's not about the greed of money. It's the greed of your time to be able to do the things that matter to you while you're alive. And I think that pursuit is the American dream. I don't think it ever ends. I think even in this COVID crazy 2020 year, uh, we have deals that are huge now. This, this year has just started uh, airing. Mm -hmm. First year, we had $50 million valuations. And you're right, the major venture capital firms want their deals on Shark Tank now because they want the free exposure to 10 million eyeballs each week. Mm -hmm. And that allows them to acquire customers at a very low cost. So most of the investments I'm investing in now have sales, they already have infrastructure, there are companies that are up and running, and I'm just using the gasoline of Shark Tank exposure to en enhance the value of that investment. You know, it's, it's funny, that one of the questions that I get asked, I, I was on twice, and um, one of the That's questions- That's very rare, that's very yeah. rare. I was almost, yeah. I, I, so, so what do I need to do to actually be a shark? How much money do I need to make to actually be a guest shark? That's you the know, question. You, you I, have need to, to I need to email Clay. Yeah, you have to email Clay, the producer, and tell him you're ready to, you have to come onto the set each day with at least a million cash because the deals now, the average deal size is 300,000. You're gonna do two or three a day. You know, half of them are gonna close. You're gonna spend some money on Shark Tank these days, but the good news is they're really good companies and generally you get your money back and then some. So I have recently started thinking about and looking at different angel investing opportunities for myself. Um, but before we, get, before we get to that, if we get to that, um, what would you say is, you know, you see, you see a lot of, you see a lot of deals on Shark Tank. You see a lot of, you know, people that, that think every, every single person that goes into Shark Tank thinks that their idea is amazing. Right. <laughs> and I always joke with people. I say, you know, people need better friends because some of the ideas, some of these businesses, they are absolute dogs. But um, a lot of people will say to me, they're like, oh, what's Kevin? What are the sharks like? offset. I'm like, I have no idea. They don't, you don't interact and, and mingle with these people. Um, because, you know, it is when, when you're filming a Shark Tank, you know, season, it's, you know, one entrepreneur right after the other, after the other, after the other. What is a tip that you would give an entrepreneur that, you know, thinks, oh, I'm going to go on Shark Tank and absolutely crush it. What is a tip that you would give them their number one tip to be successful on Shark Tank? And then I'll tell you mine. Well, there, there, there is a history of, you know, looking for those attributes and successful pitches over the 12 years, over a decade now. And there, and there are some, but the one that matters the most, there's actually three, but I'll tell you, if you can't explain in the first minute and a half what problem you're solving and why your idea has merit and why you are the right person to execute the business plan, and you know your numbers, how big is the market, how fast is it growing, what's the break-even analysis, what are the gross margins, all those things. You have to encapsulate that probably in the first five minutes. If you can't do that, you're done. You're just, you're, you're dead. And, and you, this, you can see the sharks tune out right away. If you're still rambling on five minutes in, we don't know what you're selling, you're finished. And that's, by the way, that's the way it should be because you'll get killed in the real world anyways. And so you really have to focus on explaining, here's the problem, here's how I'm solving it, here's why it has value to people, and here's why I'm the right person to execute and build this business. And lastly, ask me anything about the business model. I know the numbers inside out. Those are, those are, that's what really matters. What is your personal biggest failure professionally? It, oh, I've had many. I mean, it's not like, um, I tell people, I tell entrepreneurs, you only need one success to pay for all your failures. I mean, it's, it's, that's the way life is. I've had many investments go to zero. I've lost lots and lots of money, uh, but I've had phenomenal successes. And, you know, it's sort of, luckily I have one more success than all the failures put together. That's kind of, 
That's how it is when you're an entrepreneur, you get winners and losers. But I generally learn from each of my mistakes and I get to be a better investor. Probably one of my biggest um, financial losses was a startup I did in online gaming with one of the large telcos as my partner, a giant telco. And I learned the lesson that, you know, working with a behemoth like that and trying to do something entrepreneurial is next to impossible because you have to do everything by committee. It was a stupid mistake, but not before I'd spent a ton of money on it. So I won't make that mistake again. Uh, but I've also had some, you know, incredible outcomes, like when we sold plated to Albertsons for 300 million, $320 million. That paid for a lot of Shark Tank mistakes. And that was the biggest outcome in, in Shark Tank history ever. So there's always, you know, uh, in, in, in now with 50 companies, every day I have something catastrophic happening to a third of them, something euphoric <laughs> happening to a bunch of them. And then in the middle, everybody's just struggling. So it, it, it's, you know, I've just learned to live with the volatility. What do, but, you, what, uh, do you think, what do you think the hardest part of, of being successful in, in a business is? What do you think the, the thing that people have to figure out in order to, because I'll say, you know, you can have the greatest product in the world, but if people don't know about it, it's, it's going to die, right? I personally think that marketing is one of the biggest things that people have to, you know, it, it's critical that they figure out the marketing component of the business in order to be successful, regardless of what the product is. But what is your opinion? What is the, the, the one thing that, that they really need to figure out if they're going to be successful? The, I would be even more granular about it. It is marketing, yes, but I would be very specific. The, the one reason 80% uh, of startups fail in America now within 36 months is they're never able to get their customer acquisition costs below the lifetime value of the customer, which is a fancy way of saying they go bankrupt advertising. If you, know, if you have a product that you sell for $100 and you make $50 on it, you know, in terms of contribution after your cost of goods and everything else, and it costs you $55 to acquire the customer to buy it, you're going to go bankrupt. And that's basically what happens to 80%. They never find a way to market to a place where their customer acquisition cost is reasonable. And I see that countless times. I mean, it's just, the first question I ask any deal now is, do you know your customer acquisition costs? And if they say, what's that? Well, I certainly don't invest in it. And the ones that say, yes, I do, I say, show me. Show me your assumptions. And if in fact they figured it out, I'm happy to spend millions of dollars because then I'm just pouring gasoline on an already effective marketing and business model. And that's the way you make money. You amplify something that's already working. I love deals like that. When do you know it's time to give up? This is something that, uh, that I think a lot of entrepreneurs, unfortunately, or fortunately will face. And I think that, um, you know, depending on, on your ability to sort of <laughs> be honest with yourself, um, it, it can ultimately, some people will just drag, drag on and on and on for, you know, five, 10 years and the business should have, should have shut down, you know, seven years ago. What is your sort of, what is something that somebody should look for in their, their business or their, their entrepreneurial journey that's letting them know, keep going, or on the flip side, when is it time to actually pack it up and, and end it? Well, what, what's encouraging someone uh, should be that revenues are increasing. You're, pro you're probably not profitable, but if you start something and you get past half a million in sales, that generally is validating the product or service. And then if you can get past a million and then get on your way to 5 million, um, you have a business. I mean, th those, that 500,000, that 1 million, and then, then after a million, 5 million, those are the kind of steps that, that you know, give you some solace that you're onto something that's gonna work. But if you're unable to become profitable as sales are growing up to 5 million, um, probably after three years, you're still losing money. And the, the challenge will be that you won't have any capital to expand with. You see, one of the people say to me, what about Amazon? Well, Amazon always had access to public markets capital because it was growing, you know, sometimes 500% a month. But a typical business doesn't do that. And so if you're not profitable within three years, you probably don't have a business, you have a hobby. And you should take it out behind the barn and shoot it or just you know, do it as a hobby and go find a real job somewhere. Because if you really can't prove profitability over three years, something's wrong with your business. You don't have a business. And that's the way I look at it. So I'm, I, I often have to take various companies that I have control in. I have to take them behind the barn. And you know what I have to do? Because I'm, I can't waste my time. I can't waste my capital. And more importantly than anything, I don't want them to waste their time. 
A great entrepreneur generally has two or three failures before they find their deal. And so I want them to realize why they lost out, what was wrong with that business and start something else. I would actually much rather invest in someone who's failed a few times because they felt the sting of failure and the motivation to succeed is even more powerful. So you know, I will say one thing, Aaron, that we haven't touched on in the past because we've talked a few times. Something changed last year uh, regarding uh, entrepreneurs and Shark Tank companies and startups. It used to be the only way you could raise money was venture capital, hedge funds, or private equity firms that had venture you know, funds to, to dole out. And they always wanted preference shares and they wanted special uh, you know, attributes to their investment. They generally would buy a third of your company. Uh, they had control provisions sometimes. It was very onerous. But in the last 18 months, equity crowdfunding is now viable. And I've got multiple Shark Tank companies using like Start Engine is the one that I invested in. There's, there's, not, there's more than just one, but the one I'm getting behind, I'm a paid spokesperson there, plus an investor, and I've got my own companies in there. We raise up to 1,070,000 on, on these CF rounds, they're called, where you can just let, the, let your customers or the crowd put up 200 bucks, 100 bucks, 500 bucks, whatever it is, and you can raise millions of dollars that way, and that's what we're doing. So we're bypassing the venture capital firms because we don't need them. And I think that's a big trend uh, coming forward. You're going to see, in fact, Start Engine just last week announced a new trading platform where you can trade the shares of your company just like on a stock exchange. And they're doing that with their own shares now. So it's come full circle. It's a new form of fundraising. That was actually one of my questions I have. You know, if you're starting a business, how do you raise $100,000? Like that, what, yeah. is, what is the number? And, and just, yeah, um, just, Well, you can raise 250, you can raise up to a million 70,000. It's called startengine.com. Go we'll link to it, it down below. That's, yeah, that's, and you'll you see all kinds of companies on it. I mean, all kinds of ideas. And that's the beauty of it. If you can do a good video for 30 or 40 seconds and you can tell a story in two paragraphs, you can raise capital. And that's really the way the world has is, is, is gone through the cycle of COVID. So talk a little bit about passive income. You obviously have a bunch of passive income streams. How many just ballpark would you say that you have each month getting, getting some type of income from? Well, I have a very large advisory business. I'm a spokesperson for uh, Eureka, which is a Facebook spin out. I'm a spokesperson, as I just mentioned, for uh, Start Engine. And another one that I'm very close to that's very important to me, I discovered during, again, the PPP loans. If you, don't, if you didn't have your payroll and accounting records up to speed, you didn't get PPP. So now I'm, I'm involved in a company called TaxHive, which does accounting for small companies. And, and I, it's so important to get your accounting ready, not only for the IRS, but if you want government support in any of the programs, you got to have records. So I've become an investor in that and a paid spokesperson. So those are three advisory businesses. That's a stream of income. I have a team of, um, well, I've got about 50 employees now across my bean stocks, which we haven't talked about yet, O shares and O'Leary Ventures, and they all kind of work together. Um, I have a very large uh, fixed income portfolio. Well, not very large, lot, you know, it's, it's relative yeah. to, there's always a richer guy, Aaron, you know that. I, yeah. I, I have a fixed income portfolio. I have an equity portfolio. I've got, and everything I own, um, as you know, I love royalty deals, spends a little cash off every month. And every month, I just got them today for last month, was my tear sheets. Every single source of income, I know exactly what I made last month, how much I spent, and I never let those numbers get too far away from each other. I don't want to go into debt ever. You also, but, and, and that's another, another point I just want to talk about. You and I both have something in common. You hate debt as much yeah. as I do. I had to file bankruptcy back in uh, 2006. And at that point, you know, debt, when you have a lot of debt, it is absolutely joy, soul sucking, horrible. Like it, yeah. it, it's the worst, it's the worst thing ever. Um, and so when I when I finally was was you know able to file bankruptcy or I decided that that's what I had to do because I had literally like three or four hundred thousand dollars in debt you know I was driving a beer cart at a gas at a country club just to put gas in my car and and my business failed um, you know I, I decided that if I'm gonna have to do this I'm never gonna be in this position again and so for me debt I think is the devil. You also are very, very similar. I know that a lot of people, you, you recently saw or hung out with um, uh, Graham Stephan, right? And, and Graham, you know, these guys are all about, you know, investing in real estate and, and, you know, 
the one thing that I took away from that interview that you did with him, he has a lot of money in cash. Well, one of the reasons why he has a lot of money in cash is that he has a lot of debt on pretty much all of his all of his assets that he's that he has. Yeah. If, if the shit hits the fan, you're fucked a little bit if you're holding, you know, a bunch of notes on all these different properties, these assets. Well, and it's so- also when he when he buys this is a, most real estate guys the same way they use debt to purchase new properties. And I always urge people to realize that if you lose the tenant, you have no cash flow. You better have some cash on the side to support your debt. Um, just during periods of really deep, steep declines like 07, 08 in the market. And so he's figured that out. So he's got himself a big cushion of cash. And there's a reason because he has a lot of debt on the buildings. But you do not like debt personally. No, I don't have debt. I don't use debt. Um, I think if you can't afford to buy it, don't buy it. And the things that my mother taught me this, it's a very simple premise about buying things. Um, I like to, that's why I'm in the watch and pen collecting business. Generally speaking, and I, I do this with my watch collection, I mark to market the value of the, of the collection every night, um, just from the cloud. There's so many different services out there now that look at the trade. I can tell you that this Daytona traded last night in Asia for 29,000 US dollars, a similar model to it. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to get 29 instantly. It's not that liquid but I would get somewhere within 15 to 20% of that, which is still a huge return on what I paid for the watch. So I, I, I look at the things I buy and say, was this a purchase that's going to appreciate in value over time? And you know, there, there are many things that you can buy that don't appreciate, but certainly my art collections, my watches, my pens, even to some extent my cars, I think ahead as my mother taught me, she used to buy Chanel, that's it, Chanel jackets. I've always told this story. 40 years later, when she passes away, the women in my family fought like cats and dogs to get at her clothing. Her vintage Chanel jackets were trading for thousands of dollars in the open market. I had to beat them with a stick saying, hold on, <laughs> we've, got, we've got to allocate this stuff amongst you. You know, this is mom's stuff, but she was, she was crazy about that. She would only buy when she was a young girl, one Chanel jacket in a year. And she wore it her whole life. That kind of thinking about quality purchase about style and fashion, which is something you know about. Um, you know, like I spent months and months uh, on these cufflinks with Deacon in London, you know, deciding to buy these and they were one of a kind made for me because I know 20 years from now, these cufflinks, they're not going down in value because there are no other ones like them. That's so the kind of thinking I have. So let's talk a little bit before I let you go, Kevin, let's talk a little bit about, about money is in terms of investing. Um, you know, growing up, yeah. I think that, you know, you were talking about your mother buying Chanel jackets. You were in a different um, income bracket, it sounds like, than, than a lot of people were. You, you, if she was buying Chanel jackets, you know, well, she that, had That's the funny thing. No, she wasn't. She was a seamstress on a, you know, on a factory floor making kids winter clothing. But she, okay. would save, she would save 20% of her salary for the things she dreamt about. But you've hit on a very important point. What she learned at a young age, she would take, she took 20% of her salary. What I learned about all those people that in my own businesses that had no money, I did a quick little research study and I actually asked a couple of guys to help me. There are a hundred million Americans with no investment account. That means they are not saving anything. That freaked me out. I've, I've said 2021 is going to be the year that I get behind financial literacy. I invested in an app called Beanstalks, B-E-A-N-S-T-O-X, that you can download and put a hundred bucks out of your account each week to work. You can automate it. It's, we've automated, made it really simple. And that, that's the, that is the logo, you know, really easy. It's very simple investing. And, and even if you don't understand how to buy a stock or bond, we use ETFs to give you a very diverse portfolio. What is an ETF? That was a question that I, yeah, I, I think a lot of people don't understand that. It, and, it's it's, an exchange, and investing is scary. Well, yeah. it's true, but an exchange traded fund is what an ETF is. It's a basket of stocks. Instead of having the risk of owning one stock, an ETF may have a hundred stocks in it and you buy one unit of the ETF, you get complete diversification across a hundred stocks, which I, that's how I invest in equities. So being stocks does that for you. It, it helps you put a hundred bucks to work each week. So 400 a month. And if you do that and the market does what it has done for the last 40, 50 years, you end up with about a million and a half in the bank when you're 65. 
I want everybody to do that. I don't care if you use bean stocks or something else. I, I made bean stocks because I invested in it because I couldn't find one that was easy enough to use. I mean, there's all kinds of trading platforms and you can get a trade and be a day trader and all that. But 99% of the people can't do that and they don't know how to do it. And that's what bean stocks is for, to make it really easy to invest. But I, I would find some way, because there's, Aaron, you know this, there's always something you don't need to buy. Some piece of crap that you bought last week for hundred bucks, you shouldn't have. You should invest that in your own future and let it grow over time so that when you retire, you have enough money in the bank to continue living. Absolutely. So how did you get involved with Beanstalks? How did that, it, you, were, you, were, you were just like, hey, there's nothing simple. There, there's a better way. There's a better mousetrap. How did you... How did you come up with this idea? Was somebody did somebody bring it to you and say, "Hey, look what we're developing," or was this an initiative an initiative that you undertook? Well, you know, I have a company called OShares. It's an ETF company, and it's got about a billion plus dollars uh, under management in it. And I talked to the the team there. Connor O'Brien's the CEO, and I told him about my story about the hundred million people that don't have anything to invest. And you know, his, his initial answer was, why don't they just open an account at you know, one of the online brokerage accounts? And I said, no, you don't get it, Connor. These people don't know anything about investing. And I've got you know, thousands of them in my own companies. I need something that's so simple that you download it on your phone, you're 20 years old, and you just tell it to take 100 bucks out of your bank account each week and invest it for you. And that's it. And he said, well, you know, let, let's, we'll do a little research. And he couldn't, he showed me a bunch of apps that were out there. None of them did what I wanted. So I said, look, I'll fund it. I'll fund it. Just I'll, I'll, I'll pay to, to build it and, uh, and I'll support it. And so we just launched this thing recently and it's on the, uh, you know, you can download it on, on any app store and try it, try it out. Uh, it's, it's uh, very transparent. It's very effective. I've been talking about it now for months and it's going to be my big portion 2021. I want everybody that works within my companies to start saving a minimum of 10% of their salary, minimum. And, and then just start, because I, I never want to hear that again. I have nothing in the bank. Like that just freaks me right out. And you're, you're 29 years old. Are you mm -hmm. kidding me? Like that's nuts. Absolutely. And so so we'll link to uh, Beanstalks down below. Um, what is the fee structure like? Is it, I was looking at- I, think I, I like looked at all, I looked at all the fee structures and I said, yeah. I want it really simple. I want a straight five bucks a month. That's it. One price, regardless of how much you invest. I don't care if you have a million dollars in there yeah. or you have 10,000, it's five bucks. Cause I didn't want some sneaky plan where we hide fees and all that stuff. Cause it's me, it's my name. So I just said, make it transparent. Tell people what they're paying each month and what they, how, they, how they use it. And that's what we did. I think it's very refreshing just to be transparent about all that stuff. And, and frankly, it works. That's excellent. So, so um, we're gonna link to everything down below. Uh, Kevin, let me ask you a few questions before we wrap things up. Um, you're an entrepreneur, you're thinking about starting a business. Do you need a business plan? What is a business plan good for? And is there a situation and circumstance where it is not needed? Because that's something what a lot of people, you know, when I was starting my businesses, I, I thought, okay, I need to, you know, develop this like really, you know, granular business plan. I need to, you know, think through everything, which I think is one of the, the upsides to a business plan. But, but what is your experience with business plans and how much time and energy should you put into that? Because one of the other reasons is, or one of the other issues I see is that a lot of people spend a lot of time planning and, and it almost prevents them from moving forward and taking action on their idea. And so what is your sort of idea or, or strategy behind that? Well, the reason you would want a business plan, and I've, I've done it both ways with investments I've made, no business plan and business plan, I'm gonna to err towards the side of having one, is it forces you to write down and think through your assumptions about what's gonna happen. I don't, you know, put a lot of weight into forecasts that are more than 36 months long. So, you know, you can show me this 10-year spreadsheet. It doesn't mean anything to me because I know so much is going to change. But it really forces you to think through things like gross margin, volume and scale, reduction of costs. And it shows me that you have the ability to, you know, organize your thoughts in terms of rolling something out. Now, if you're unable to present a business plan, you're probably going to have a hard time getting investors. They like to look at the plan. But in having said that, I've learned over time, you never want a deck, as it's called, more than 12 pages. If you can't explain the business in 12 pages or less, no one's going to fund it. It's way too complicated. So you want it really concise, some basic assumptions, explain what you think you can achieve under worst case, 
middle case, best case scenario, and try and live within those parameters. And that, I find that very helpful to help me as an investor understand where you want to go. And then when we review it a year later saying, well, what was wrong about the original plan? What was right? What, what can we change? What do we now know? Number one tip to build long-term wealth. Oh, that's, that's really a good one. Um, it's a very simple equation. You can't spend beyond your means. You, you have to look at what you make in 90 days over three months and what you spend over three months and be honest with yourself. And if you're basically spending more than you make, you're going to go bankrupt and you will not have any long-term wealth. That's step one. You've got to align yourself to where you're at least breaking even on your income. And over time, you want to start saving 10% of what you make and start investing it. But I've also learned in my own life how important it is to listen to my mother. Don't buy crap. If you can't afford a good piece of clothing or something that you're going to buy for yourself that isn't really high quality, don't spend on it. Because if you, if you buy high, very few high quality things, you'll wake up a decade later and those things will have appreciated in value. And that's in so many different asset classes. That includes your home. It includes you know, things like a watch. Even if you only buy one watch, make it a good one because you'll find that it's worth 10 times more than what you paid for it with pens if you're going to buy that. I'm not talking about expensive jewelry, just quality things. Even in clothing, what I found out in talking to you know, a lot of my sons and daughters' friends, they buy so much crap that they never wear. The things you wear are the five things that you love in your wardrobe. You're into this stuff. You know this 100%. <laughs> True. You want to buy, you don't have to spend big dollars, but you want quality and you want it to be something you really love. You know, I have 25 of these suits. It's the same suit. It's a uniform I have. You know that. And I love the stuff you gave me last time we worked together. I wear that ca on a casual basis all the time. I was so but excited I, when I saw that leather jacket on Shark Tank when you went to yeah, that school in Tennessee. I, <laughs> I, I, that, I'm that, like, that it's jacket, my jacket. <laughs> that, that, that jacket's sitting in my closet in Florida. When I get down there in a month, I'm going to be wearing that all over Miami. So, you know, I love that's, it. That's, uh, thank you for it. But the point is, buy, you don't need a lot of stuff. You need good quality stuff that you really like that looks good on you. And you have to shop very wisely. That's how you amass wealth over time. Kevin O'Leary, where can people find you? You know, the best place to find me is on my YouTube channel, which I'm spending a lot of time on these days. Ask Mr. Wonderful. And it's, it's, um, it is I'm really amazing. You've done such a good job. When I yes. saw you starting to, to post videos, I'm like, this is going to go somewhere. And, and, and what the thing that you have done incredibly well is, is consistency and just, you know, putting it out, putting it out, putting it out. And you really, I think YouTube, you found your home because you're, you're good on Shark Tank, but you're, even better when it's just off the cuff answering questions and you bring so much value to, you know, just, just people for free. And that's the thing like that blows my mind. You know, there's so much amazing free information out there, whether or not yeah. you want to start a business. If you're not watching shark tank, you're an idiot. If you, you know, if you want any type of financial literacy, you're not, you know, you're not watching your stuff. There's just so much free stuff out there. And, and the value that you're bringing is ridiculous. I, I think it's a, it's a good point you're making, but I, I try and look at each week. We get thousands of questions and I try and distill it into maybe four or five categories and answer those. And I'm getting a lot of questions about what you just asked about, you know, buying stuff and, and how to live within your means and, th and just pragmatic stuff like that. So that's what I'm really focusing on. And people know I love watches and pens and guitars and all that. So I get thousands of questions about that. But you know, I, I try and, and talk about general things that would help someone in that journey they're taking. And so many people you know, get lost by, by just basically going bankrupt on themselves. It's their own fault. The two areas that I, I tell people, the two areas that you can cut back are your, your, your housing and your automobile. I think that, and, and one of the downsides to this age of social media is, is excesses everywhere. And we see all these people, you know, putting stuff out there. But if you do two things, that is live in a place that might not be as, as nice as you could afford and drive a car that isn't the forty fifty thousand dollar car. Maybe get a used car. Maybe maybe buy you know the 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 twenty thousand dollar car versus the forty thousand dollar car. Those two areas amount for like eighty percent of our expenses or something to that effect. I heard. But but you know, if you really want to do oh, well, that's in the future, true. That's true. But you know, I I'm talking to you from my home in Boston right now. One of my favorite homes. I love this place. It's not huge, but it's right downtown. 
It's right across from the Commons Park. I don't have a car in Boston. I walk everywhere. Everything's within two miles of me. I'm happy to, to walk around all day long. Everybody says, well, you have a parking spot. Why don't you have a car? I said, don't want it. Don't need it. I don't, I don't want that expense. I don't need it. And it's healthy to walk. I like walking. It clears your head. So, you know, I walk around this place. I, I was, I've been out three times already today just to go do stuff and come back. And I think you have to adjust your lifestyle according to what really makes sense. Do you exercise? Oh, every day. Yep, I do. I'm now on the Peloton for about 30 minutes and the elliptical for about 20. And then I try and walk my 10,000 steps a day. You got to do that stuff. You, you, you also have got, to do Kevin, that. Kevin, you got you to gotta lift weights too, man. <laughs> oh, I have that. I have a Shark Tank deal you haven't seen yet that, um, that is a very interesting product. And I have those too. Very cool product. All right. Excellent. Well, Kevin, we're going to link to everything down below that we talked about. I just want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule and, and talking to me one more time. You're an inspiration. Whenever anybody says to me, oh, is Kevin really a jerk in real life? I go, no, Kevin is, <laughs> is, is not only a sweetheart, he's one of the sharpest sharks that's, that's out there. And so, Kevin, thank you so much for spending time with us. And, and I wish you nothing but success moving forward and, and excited to see what you do next. Thank you so much, Aaron. Take care, my friend. And tell Clay I want to I want to see. Yeah, now that I know, I'll let him know. I'll talk to him. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kevin. Take care. Take care. Bye bye.